Hello, my name is Adam Stead, and as the pandemic recedes, I'm on a mission to understand what makes different venues successful. To that end, I'm interviewing some amazing people from different kinds of hospitality businesses to ask them what makes their business tick. This is Served With Podcast, and you can find it on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. This week, I'm talking to Annika Wainwright, who runs the menu consultancy Two Forks. Two Forks have worked on loads of exciting menus, including businesses as famous as Oaxaca and Coca-Cola. The menu is the beating heart of communication in a restaurant. It's their main piece of marketing real estate, and it's something restaurants don't think enough about. So I was curious what Annika had to say about it and how I could engineer, optimize, write, or otherwise paint my menu into something really exciting. I've got a hot take. Okay. Menus are generally too large. Yes. You agree? I agree. Absolutely. <laughs> Very good. Nothing, nothing to talk about there then. Um, people get overwhelmed. If, if, if you put a mega menu in front of particularly a man, they look at that thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And they just look, oh, I can't be bothered. Where's the steak? I, I think uh, as a cons- this is very much as a consumer uh, rather than from a, a hospitality business standpoint. I think I think that there's a, there's actually a uh, choosing the right thing on the menu is a skill. Mm-hmm. I think in some venues there is a correct dish. One there is a dish that is better than the other dishes. Yeah. And if you follow a kind of strict set of algorithmic rules, like I'm in a pub, maybe I'm going to not order the pasta, mm-hmm. for example. Yeah. But that are far more detailed and wide ranging than that, then you can generally navigate to the the best dish yep. with some efficiency. Absolutely. Do you think that's right? I think that's right. And I think it should be the job of the menu to guide people towards yeah. those dishes that you know um, people are very happy. So what's what's what makes a bad menu then? A bad menu um, is a menu that doesn't guide customers to the best experience. So um, they don't understand what the restaurant experience is all about. They don't understand how to order. Um, It doesn't help them find the things that they're going to enjoy. There are so many things that can be bad about a menu. A lot of menus look the same. They're obviously sort of best practice things and there are uh, tricks and, and design layouts that you can apply that will usually make for a good experience because it's what people are used to. Mm. But every, um, every restaurant is a different entity. The space and the people and the customers and the food and the concept, everything is unique to that particular space. It has to, to, to fit the, the job that it's there to do. Best practices, mm-hmm. are they... I guess, how far do you think it is normally just the best thing to follow the best practices for your type of business? Or when should you think we're going to do something more special with this menu? I think the best practices um, are there as your sort of arsenal of things that you can try. But the most important thing is to make sure that it works for your customers and that it works for your space and that it works for your team. So the best practice stuff, can we just quickly kind of whiz through the things that you think of as being normal restaurant menu best practice Mm -hmm. before we kind of get into, I don't know, more complex forms of of menu optimization. Yeah. Well, one of the people that I would recommend seeking out is the behavioral scientist Robert Cialdini. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's written a book called Influence, which has been um, a sort of um, authority piece in behavioral science for years and years and years. And he talks about the sort of um, seven pillars of uh, persuasion or influence, how you can get people to do certain things. Mm-hmm. And the ones that I find are particularly um, useful for, for menus, social proof, like we are programmed as people to want to do what other people are doing. We trust our peers and our friends. If you write words to the effect of this is our most popular dish, you can you can earn 25 to 50% uh, or you can sell 25 to 50% more of that dish. Something that's a customer favorite or a bestseller is really, really um, useful. Like it's, you can also use design techniques like putting things into boxes. There's a reason why the Dishoom Dal, for example, is in a box, in a box. on the menu. It draws attention to it. Obviously, you can look at your sales data and see which ones sell the most. But another thing that people don't often think to do is to interview their front of house teams and ask them, what are the wow dishes? What are the things that you put down in front of customers and you get a, a reaction? Wow. Yes. And 
because reviews, um, on online reviews, for example, you can look at those, but people tend to only review a place when they had a great or a special experience. They've been for a birthday yes. meal or whatever. The, the middle sector that, that never go online, you know, the regulars that would never leave a review every single time they came to a restaurant. So they will, they will know what people love, what people tell them. They will know um, what people are confused about, whether a dish isn't what they expected it to be. I'm a big fan of data and I'm a bit of a data geek, but it never tells the whole story. So the fact that you've sold a lot of a particular thing, yeah. it could be that the description on the menu is, is really good. You know, yeah. um, another technique that you can use to make your menu better is to talk more like your customers. So using words that they would use and language that they understand and in, in the sort of using um, the voice of customers. As you um, reciprocation is something you can use as well. So you give someone something for free and then they, they sort of feel automatically entitled to give you something back. So how, how does that work in the context of a the menu then? Um, so it, it puts people in a more generous spirit. Yes. Um, which is quite cool. Um, I see. So, it, so actually the, the basket of bread at the start and other things. Exactly. And if, if there's anything that you can put on your menu to demonstrate that you're giving something for free, so mm -hmm. um, you can say complimentary bread and olives, just ask. Instead of making that sort of two pounds or three pounds that you were gonna charge for that extra. I think it's completely subconscious and you don't really <laughs> understand that you're doing it, Yeah. Um, but it, it, it works. So it's something you can play around with. What can we give? If one of your objectives is to sort of boost your uh, staff tip, for example, there've been lots of studies showing if, if you give mints or small sweets with the bill, people, people tip are much more, more generously. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, the Rosa's Thai menu, for example, has a really lovely piece of storytelling on the very back page that's all about there's a map of Thailand and it's got um, details about all of the ingredients that they source directly that's lovely. that kind of thing so and a trick if you want to for example a lot of restaurants want to sell more drinks because there's a lot of profit in yeah. drinks so if you can engineer your menu so that um, drinks come come early on so you so you're suggesting an aperitif before um, before right. the meal that sets the cadence for the consumption the wine and if if you get into the habit of ordering a drink early on you're much more likely right. to order to more keep drinks ordering more drinks later speaking of tips and feedback here's a tip about feedback if you have store kit order and pay we systematically ask your guests to review your store and you can link the data of what somebody ordered to their nps score to see which of your meals are the best and here's some feedback about tips slap and pickle found that their tip intake was about 80 percent higher in the venue that had store kit than the one that didn't but now it was time to get Annika's live thoughts, as I wanted to make this discussion practical. I had some menus to show her. So I'm going to, what I want to do now, so I want to show you some menus. Mm -hmm. uh, I just kind of want to hear your reaction to them. Okay. So obviously you've not been, uh, with ex the exception of one, which I think you may have worked on, the, you've not been privy to the okay. process that has... No, I know nothing. You know, <laughs> that has led to the menu being as it is. But I wonder whether you can kind of interpret, because this is actually what I do when I go to a, I'm a, I'm a bit of a bore. I should say, as I forgot to introduce it, that we started with a large A3 bright colored Nando's menu, which includes a periometer and has me desperate for some grilled chicken. The first word that comes into my head is busy. You know, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot going on here. On the other hand, I know that Nando, Nando's is a very successful business. So it's obviously <laughs> doing something for people. But in terms of helping and guiding people who perhaps haven't been to Nando's before, it's good to see that there are some quite distinct groupings of things so that it's easy to find. If you want something greener, a salad, they've even used color, show you what the salad, where the salad section is, all the sandwiches and wraps are together. The favorites is actually quite a, a, a surprisingly kind of, small kind section. Kind of tuck, tucked away, isn't it? Yeah, they're kind of fighting each other here. Even within the boxes, there are box out dishes <laughs> <laughs> to sort of show, right, you've found us, you've found this section, here's the one you should be having in here. Good, but not that good, is what we think about this one. I think they, they have probably tested and they know a lot about techniques and tricks, but yeah. they're trying to apply them all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Dishoom. Which, which I'm going to say is the most famous menu in menu circles in 
Britain. People love it. People love it. <laughs> and it works. It makes a lot of money. Um, I believe the designer behind the original menu uh, was the Dushim team in um, in collaboration with the design agency and Smith. And when you're sitting in there and you're looking around and all the little details are just perfect, the sort of Hindi script on the walls, yeah. and, um, the toilets are always a bit of an experience. And um, there's so much detail. And the fact that those those kind of cafes in Bombay would always have newspapers. Um, it just makes so much sense for the menu to look. <laughs> yes, I've, I've never been to Bombay. I've never <laughs> been to a mid-century Iranian cafe in Bombay, but I'm taking it. I know exactly where I am. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the bow menu, mostly because of the interactivity that it offers. So people like to get involved and having a pencil and, and writing things down, it's a bit of fun. For some reason, people love filling out forms. Bao doesn't have a particularly large selection, but in a dim sum restaurant, for example, where there might be hundreds of different things, uh, it helps avoid overwhelm to have tick boxes and the pencils so that you can actually start making your choices. But I love the way that that wall of text is broken up by the very clear grid system. Yeah. And then I also love the cute illustration. Illustration can be a really good way of introducing a visual element to your menu without resourcing, uh, resorting to photos which tend to age quicker. It, this is a, a small plates menu. Obviously it's, it's bow buns. The most common question that I seem to ask is, how how many plates is right for this many people? Standard I'm way to do that on the that, that question isn't actually answered on this menu, um, and that's one of those questions that possibly are, is grating on the staff because they get it over and over <laughs> again. So if if you do have an offer that isn't that familiar with people, it could be a really good idea. Not so much bow because they're all homogenous size, but with uh, with like tapas, mm -hmm. it's always funny when they're like, oh, they're completely random sizes. We have no way of knowing. Yeah. Depends on what you pick. Be able to split this? Are well, we going to be fighting you get over it, the last? You get form? into a thing where it's like, okay, I want to buy one expensive thing, and then I ought to have something that's a filler. I'm going to get the patas bravas. Yes. Because, <laughs> <just> <laughs> we can't case. afford to exist on tuna ceviche alone. <laughs> Skip through to this. So this is this is Franco Manca. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this? I like it. I, I think it really reflects the brand. It's uh, it's very neatly organized. You know which way to go. So they obviously are trying to encourage you to have a bite of some some kind to start. So um, one of the sort of best practice things that we know about the way that people navigate menus is that they tend to start in the top left corner. Yes. However, I would say that in this case, the larger text of sourdough pizza, the font hierarchy tells me that this is the most important header yeah. and that this is almost a kind of side note. Yeah. I think if it hadn't been bigger, the pizza section would probably have just blended into everything else, Yeah. which... Um, from a sales perspective would perhaps not be a bad idea because if you blended the pizza in a little bit, um, you could draw more attention, attention to other areas. My guess is they have designed this from a user experience perspective. Um, to put your bikes to start anywhere, the best placement for them would be the top left corner. So I put this one on. The reason I did, so this is from uh, the Wheat Sheaf Inn. So this is from a pub that is... Uh, a kind of gastro pub. It's a nice pub, close to my parents' house uh, in the kind of in the countryside. It looks like it's been designed in Microsoft Word. I think. Do you think that there's ways that this menu could be improved really quickly? Well, this is as classic as a British menu will get. Um, this is really where we are most comfortable and what we're used to. These are the menus we've been ordering from since the 60s if yeah. not further. Um, so one thing that it has going for it is familiarity. Um, one thing that it perhaps doesn't do is guide you in any way towards, <laughs> you know, what's going to be good on here. And given that this is a pub and they presumably want to sell drinks from the bar, um, I would include a drink section next to the pub nibbles with some kind of nibble. Well, you know what's, you know what's interesting? Pubs, so um, premium drinks, you, you tend to, in pubs, one of the, one of the things that having a, a menu on the phone changes is that people suddenly buy more premium drinks. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that, with particularly with like bar-led businesses is that um is, is that people are embarrassed to ask the price of the whiskies and then say actually i don't want to pay to spend that much well you you just don't know do you yeah um, but you've no idea I, if i pointed at a whiskey bottle and said i'll have that i'm exposing myself to 
anything. <laughs> when you do have the prices available in a digital menu, uh, people will probably make that choice. I can afford oh. the Grey Goose. But even when you have a separate drinks menu, it's always a good idea to experiment with some drink selections on your food menu as well, particularly to get people into the mindset of drinks right from the off, so pairing some drinks with the nibbles. Mm -hmm. And the menu could also be a really effective place to uh, put wine suggestions. So. Yeah. You're listening to Served With Podcast. And finally, I wanted to find out how I should go about building my menu from scratch as a hospitality business owner. <clears throat> We do research first, so yeah. we, we always look at how customers use the menu. We look at what, sales. So how customers use the menu, what, is, what does that mean? Um, so we would either do um, intercepts in the restaurant where we um, will observe people ordering and then step up and say, do you mind telling us a little bit about what you just did there? How, yeah. how were you thinking? Or since COVID, we've actually been doing a lot of um, um, t interactive play on, on Zoom where we send menus to customers we so i i think of a menu i think i look at the menu i read the options i choose the food mm -hmm. I, that to me is the way most people would use oh it could be really, really I'm, I, I, different I, <laughs> <laughs> so what ideally as an operator what you want is for people to sit down and go right what should we start with a drink some nibbles uh, <laughs> and in reality what most customers do is go straight for the main course yeah sides then they decide whether they have room for a starter, they might glance at the desserts, they won't really think about the drink until they've sort of matched up what they're going to be drinking. People approach it really differently. I, I did some, um, <laughs> some work with Pizza Pilgrims where um, I was sort of trying to lead people into sort of showing me how they were thinking around drinks or whatever, and they were just adamant, no, no, you choose your pizza first. That's, <laughs> we have to do that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. So you do the research, and then and then what would be my next step in designing a menu once I'd once I'd done that research? So we we do customer research. We do back of house and front of house research just to find out what are the stumbling blocks in the kitchen, what things go together, what's a nightmare, all of that kind of side of things. Yeah. We find those silent reviews from the front of house teams. We also ask about what are the most frequently asked questions because these days retention is key in hospitality and we want to make sure staff are really happy and that they're not just all of these same questions over and over great on you. So, <laughs> And then we look at sales data to identify what are the dishes that um, sell the best? What are the dishes that make you the most money per sale? And we yep. always look at cash rather than percentage sale. That's a really good way of being able to um, cut your menus. Um, as we were talking about earlier, most menus are too long. Um, so if you categorize your dishes into sell well and make you lots of money, um, sell well um, and make you an average amount of money, um, don't sell very well but make you lots of money or uh, <laughs> oh. don't sell very well and don't make you money there's a surprising oh. <laughs> amount of those on menus all, all downside yeah <laughs> so you just want to cut those Sing the warning bell that something isn't selling very well and is not making you much money you should really be looking at cutting it yeah but what you really want to be looking at as well is why aren't things selling so quite often at restaurants particularly in the side dish section there will be one or two things that sell way more than others and then there'll be perhaps some kind of vegetables that is there to sort of oh, cater to the vegetarians or whatever it's not always the case that the most chosen thing is the best thing no people will often go for the safe option and so, so how do you so you've just got to take your sales data with a pinch of salt or, or how do you how do you navigate that it's 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 a sort of it's a bit bit of a balancing act between the experience that you want to give to people mm -hmm. and um and also trying to teach people better so where digital menus perhaps can do this a little bit better than than paper menus um i never want to lose paper menus i think they're beautiful and I, i'm a, a geek i've been collecting them <laughs> for over 20 years um but pictures help sell things it hate it helps you um make you choices can, yeah. where you perhaps wouldn't have wondered without seeing them yeah so you do the research um then the, having done that, there's a process of, of actually formulating the options, cutting things. Yeah. Uh, and then when you've got the actual list of items, you get to the design and copywriting stage. Yes. 
So we look at what the objectives were from the outset. So some restaurants just want to give the customers a better experience. Some people want to um, earn a bit of extra money, sell more drinks, sell more sides, boost a category of some si of some sort. Um, some people just um, want to um, make choices easier or um, fix operations. Whatever the goal was, uh, we will put a big list of all of the um, sort of desired outcomes and then I'll go back to my trusty cheat sheet and I'll go right what are some of the proven scientific techniques that I can apply yeah. to drive these kind of behaviors um, based on 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 what we know about how people use books stage yeah. very good I think people like to see behind the scenes yeah, of yeah, what yeah, goes 100%. on so, so then, yes, I'll take my shitty sketches over to a designer who knows what they're doing, um, and then we'll start building what the menu might look like. And then the last thing to happen is the copy. And when we're changing the copy, we're only really <coughs> looking to make it clearer, um, more like the language of the customer, so they resonate with, with it more, uh, more descriptive and useful. So th there's a tendency of using what I, what I like to call empty adjectives that don't really add anything. Food writing's notoriously difficult, right? Mm. Um, I guess because the task is to describe something that is a very personal experience. Well, yes, because you're right. It's, it's, there's, especially with what I would sort of think of as like italics writing, like, mm -hmm. uh, like a restaurant that maybe has, uh, you know, black and white print, but printed on nice paper in italics. And then they're sort of describing things as the best, the finest words that are nice, but are actually filler words. Yeah. And it is hard to actually convey something specific yeah. that doesn't just come with like, this is good. Exactly. <laughs> like the word flavorsome is, is used a lot on men menus. Really? Delicious. And you sort of think, flavorsome, what, what does that mean? Mm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of using <laughs> the actual <laughs> flavors or the spices. Or, you know, uh, yeah, 100%. descriptions that means, uh, make sense. Hello and welcome, sir, to the menu shop to peruse our menu of menus. You can see which menu I'm about to recommend because it's boxed. It's the customer favorite, but I'll get to that in a moment. For your free hors d'oeuvre, I will recommend several podcasts on which I'm something of an authority, which may whet your appetite for a cocktail or something from the starter section. Our podcasts include podcasts about vibing TikTok, marketing, but also about bread and butter of managing a thriving menu from stem and glory to pizza pilgrims. As we move on to starters, you can see the stalk it, click and collect menu is particularly popular as a pairing with the red wine Uber Eats from the California region, as you can get your favorite customers to navigate to your full menu on Storkit and retain this delivery platform as a discovery mechanism. Oh God. <clears throat> but the main way, <clears throat> but the main that we really recommend, the customer favorite, is Storkit order and pay. In our in-store mobile ordering system was called by Sir John Menu, who invented menu. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, the easiest mobile ordering system on the market. But if that's too much of a meal for you, you can just subscribe for more conversations like this one.